Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nina and I am the Events and Communications Officer here at the EAUC. Um, welcome to today's EAUC webinar. The title of the webinar is University Divestment Reflecting on the Edinburgh Experience. It is in the Leadership Life Framework and will last approximately one hour. Thank you for registering and thanks also to Dave Gorman, Director of Social Responsibility and Sustainability at the University of Edinburgh and Ian Patton, Chief Executive of the AUC, both of whom will be leading this webinar. So just a bit of housekeeping to go over before we get started. I'm hoping that everybody can hear me well. Uh, for the time being, I have placed all of your microphones on mute just to avoid some background noise. Uh, you will have opportunities throughout the webinar to ask questions, so please feel free to unmute yourselves during these sessions by clicking the microphone button to the right-hand side of your name at the top right of the screen. If you don't have a working microphone, please type any questions you have into the on-screen chat box, which can be found in the bottom right-hand corner. If you have any technical issues at all throughout this webinar, please let me know by posting them into this chat box or by sending me an email. Um, my email address is nbartlett at eauc.org.uk. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the AUC website later on today. Please feel free to share this as a resource with any colleagues or fellow EAUC members. Once the webinar has finished, you will be sent a short survey for us to gain your feedback. Please take a few minutes to complete this survey as the results will help us to improve our CPD and events in the future. So that's all from me. Uh, thanks again for registering and I will now pass you over to Ian. Hello everyone, uh, Ian Patton here. Uh, clearly this uh, webinar is, is, is on the money. It's hit the button. There's a huge number of you here and an even bigger number um, uh, who were on the waiting list, but will we'll now uh, be listening to the, the recording. Um, as Bill McKibben, the well-known American uh, environmentalist, said two years ago, he said this to Rolling Stone, actually, two years ago, here's my bet. The kids are going to win. And when they do, it's going to matter. Divestment is now a movement. Uh, I believe he's right. You have faith groups, NGOs, foundations and trusts, Local authorities, even oil-based uh, agencies like Rockefeller, have come on board and divested. So this is a rolling stone, forgive the pun. Uh, but what does that mean to a university, to its endowment, its pensions? USS is actually the UK's largest occupational fund now. To its re research funding and its role in society as an educator, researcher, leader and agent of change. So we're really grateful that Dave Gorman, Director of uh, Social Responsibility and Sustainability Edinburgh, uh, uh, is prepared to share the Edinburgh divestment story. And Dave, I I'm sure there have been highs and lows along the journey, and I'm sure you've got a few scars to show for it as well. So uh, please, uh, I'm handing over to you, Dave, now. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Hi Dave, we can hear you. Excellent, good. Good afternoon everybody, thanks for that introduction Ian. I think at the very least I owe you a drink from um, Happy Times in Harvard. So very happy to share our experience this afternoon. It has been um, an interesting journey I think and uh, I've been keen to just reflect on uh, what our experience has been rather than hold ourselves up as a panacea or, or the experts in the matter. But we did think having gone through it, it might be useful to share that experience. So it's just going to take 15 minutes or so to talk through with hopefully plenty of time for questions and we'll pause at various points as I go through the slides um, to take any questions. Uh, so moving on. First technical difficulty you need is I'm not managing to make the slide move. Let me just try again. There we go. Uh, so I thought it might be useful to just start very briefly and explain uh, who we are as a department and what we do to set the context for this. Um, so we're, we're a department of about 15 people and we have quite a wide variety of roles. In Edinburgh we've defined social responsibility quite widely and it's our job as a department to provide what we hope is high quality advice. So what does SRS mean um, and what should the university do about it? Support um, for people who want to make change in the university and, and sometimes action as well. So we'll do a series of practical 
things as well. So just to take our straps on, we try and understand and explain what the important risks and opportunities are for the university, uh, which sometimes involves advising our court or our principal or our very senior staff, but also involves um, advising anyone who has an interest. We then help develop the response to some of these challenges and opportunities, and I guess this area is a good example of that. And we also take practical action. We'll try and develop, de deliver and facilitate programs across campus. And again, a good example might be we work with Peter James at a UK level on uh, sustainable labs. So that's the background to our department. Um, we're fortunate in the sense that going back at least a decade, the strategic plans of the university have always had um, social responsibility as a thread running through them. And we seek as a university to make a significant contribution um, to the world and do that in a sustainable and socially responsible way. Um, and as you can see, just in case you didn't believe me, there it is on our, our strategic triangle. You can just about pick up social responsibility. One of the things that's worth saying is that we early on decided that the main area we could control directly was our own endowment funds. So although we have written and engaged with the U USS and with our smaller um, pension scheme, we've actually put that to one side effectively. And so everything I'm about to say focuses particularly on the endowment funds. And uh, we have, I mean, the current valuation there, it says 280 million. It's more like 300 million at the moment. Um, sounds like a lot of money, which that was my bank account. But actually, in the scheme of things, it's, it's an interesting place to be. So Harvard would be about $30 billion. Um, Oxford and Cambridge would have an endowment roughly an order of magnitude larger than that. And many other organizations would have an endowment that's smaller. And so we find ourselves in a position of being large enough to attract attention in this space, but not so large that we can devote permanent full-time resources to the question. And that's been an interesting challenge in itself. So we are about 280 million, and that has um, uh, been growing quite steadily over the years. The way in which we manage the endowment fund, again, partly related to the fact that we're saying we're not enormous, is that we have a, an investment committee, which is a subcommittee of court, um, and it has members from both court who are investment professionals, but other outside uh, experts in finance. And their job is to uh, deliver a return, so they're expected to make a return of uh, RPI plus four. They set the overall investment strategy, so it's very clearly down to them how to manage the money. Um, they also decide how to ask, uh, what's called allocate the assets to asset classes, like either directly in stocks or in tracker funds or um, in uh, fixed interest or property or whatever. And obviously, they also oversee and monitor progress to make sure they're protecting the capital and delivering a return. And the investment committee would also appoint and oversee our external managers. So unlike some of the bigger funds, like I think Oxford will manage directly, we actually use a series of external managers like Bailey Gifford or Hermes Property Fund uh, and so on. There we go. So what is responsible investment at the University of Edinburgh? We've, we've been in a position of having a socially responsible investment policy since 2003, and that arose from um, a movement to divest from tobacco. So we have a history of divestment, and we are a pretty um, large medical school, and it was just felt not consistent with our values to be investing in tobacco, but also uh, trying to then deal with the, the impacts of tobacco. So. That was a pretty uncontentious decision, I think, that was made in 2003. But at the same time, the opportunity was taken to create a policy. And um, the policy is interesting because it allows pretty much anyone in the university, so a student via the student association or a staff member via one of the committees or via the unions, to raise an activity that they think is contrary to the university's value systems. And you know we would draw that from our mission statement and goals and our corporate plan and wider issues of concern, if you like, social, environmental, and humanitarian. So there is this long-standing, decade-long agreement that the university will consider um, divestment issues and issues where, where ethical finance comes into play. Uh, just very quickly on where the endowment is invested, the, as you can see from the pie chart, the bulk is in equities. Um, either direct or via pooled equities. 
There is um, a chunk in corporate bonds and government bonds, a chunk in property, and a small amount of uh, just invested in cash terms. So I'm just going to pause there and hand back to Ian. This is just a start, really, to ho hopefully set the context for how it works in Edinburgh. Don't imagine there's too many questions, but I'll just pause and hand back to Ian. Thanks, thanks, Dave. Yes, so, so we've we've uh, factored in several opportunities for you to uh, ask questions using the chat box. Please do that at any time, and then I can ask them on your behalf. Or uh, be good to hear some of your voices as well if you have any questions. I appreciate it early on. Uh, what, uh, just give us a minute, Dave, uh, if one yep. or two come in. But Dave, can I ask? Uh, we talked about the university values there uh, as as a driver for this, but but clearly there has been new external pressure, uh, you know, uh, brought to bear on, on, on our sector uh, through through uh, excellent campaigns. You know, how, how, how was a new light shone on the values? Did it, did it trigger, did, was it that that triggered your university to start looking again? Or has this always been a thread running throughout University of Edinburgh's uh, approach to its endowment? Uh, good question, Ian. Um, I think I would say it was always likely we were going to be looking at this and looking at it in a proactive way. Now, the students would probably say that you know it didn't do any harm that we had some outside pressure, and I think they're probably right. But I'll come on to this in a second. We signed up to some good practice principles um, in 2013, and that there has been a long history of considering uh, these things. So I, I would say that you know it, it doesn't do any harm to have the outside pressure of the campaigning. But the university was always clear that it wanted to take its own decision and to look at this properly, um, because we have a tradition of doing so. And you know, the, w w as we'll come on to, people don't have to agree with what we've decided. But hopefully, one of the main things I want to get across today is that the university here takes it seriously and has had a thorough look at the issues. And we, we would we would have got around to looking at this topic anyway, as we do with quite a few other topics in the area of social responsibility, just because we have this commitment to um, try and show leadership and to also make a significant contribution that's written into our strategic plans. So, so that's my view of the world. Like I say, if you talk to some of our students, they might feel that actually that's um, gilding a lily or something. But I genuinely believe that we would have uh, uh, planned to look at these issues because they're important and because we've got our head up looking for what's coming. Uh, that's great, Dave. We've had uh, one question, uh, and either we can take it now, or if you know that the presentation will address this yep. later, we can leave it. Uh, from Jay, thanks, Jay. Is, rec is, is it recommended to just push for endowment divestment and step back from pension divestment? Are you going to be touching on that later, or would you like to deal with uh, it now? I think I'll deal with it now, then. Yeah, I think it's a good question. The reason why we took the decision to focus on endowment is we thought we had a bit more flexibility and freedom. So, you know, we are a large university, but even us, we, we pay into insignificance compared to the size of the university superannuation scheme. And it's my understanding, I'm no expert in these matters, that because there's a, a clear fiduciary duty, there's a general sense that it's harder to make pension funds move on this topic, uh, or at least that they are more constrained by the legal requirements than if you deal with an endowment fund. Now, the way the endowment fund works for us is that there are something like 7,000 donations that make up the total sum. And they are restricted in the sense that if I give you money to you know, put up a building or create a professorship, I don't expect you to have frittered it away on something else or to have lost it on the stock market. So there's a clear requirement that the money is protected in that sense. But it's also interesting, that my view is it's unrestricted once it's actually being invested, awaiting being spent. So there's often quite a time lag between the money arriving and when the money is actually needed. Or if it's endowing a, a scholarship or something, you know, you've got a capital sum that only needs some of the money to flow then every year as revenue. And so in that sense, I, I've been arguing, I think people agree that we have some degrees of freedom over the endowment fund in a way that pension funds might find more difficult. So I'm not saying that we would be casual with other people's money. Obviously, this, we, we've got this money on trust from people who want to see benefit and want to see social good. But there is quite a degree of freedom um, to 
perhaps at the margins accept a lower return, which is effectively what we're doing in certain cases in Edinburgh, because there's a justified benefit. Now, my understanding of the law is that it's possible to do that with pension funds, but it's much more difficult and people are much more nervous. And I'd probably refer you finally to the report came out from the PRI as part of its conference recently talking about fiduciary duties in the 21st century. And this is very much on the mind of pension managers um, to make sure that they don't fall foul of that duty. So it just felt generally more sensible to concentrate our efforts where we had more freedom. Dave, that's excellent. I'm going to let you crack on to the heart of your okay. presentation, uh, and there's uh, other questions coming in, and then we can pick those up. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, folks. So that was the background. So what did we decide to do? Um, we, as I say, had signed the principles for responsible investment in 2013. And what these are, for people not uh, familiar, is there are a set of process principles, if you like, that signal that a university or signatory, and there's thousands around the world now, as an asset owner takes these issues seriously and will embed what they call ESG, so environment, social, and governance issues into your investment activities. It doesn't have to be endowment funds. It can be anything. So in our case, we, we've applied it to, as I was just saying, to the endowment fund. You're required to think about how these issues are integrated into the overall investment strategy, the asset allocations you make, the appointment of managers, uh, the reporting back. So from our point of view, this was the start of a long-term journey. I think it's probably fair to say that for many students at the university, signing the PRI was a signal that the university intended to divest, which I don't think ever was the intention. So that, that was an interesting dynamic. Um, when I arrived in the middle of 2013, we had been six months into signing the PRI, and there was a, uh, a need to now get on and try to figure out what this meant. So we, we committed to doing three things, really. One is to just undertake a peer review, have a look around, see what other people are doing. We've done that, learned some interesting lessons along the way. Second, to develop a statement of investment beliefs. In other words, just update the existing responsible investment policy in the light of what signing the PRI meant. Uh, and thirdly, in fact, I've just covered that, is, is you know, go, uh, create a plan to go about um, uh, updating the policy in the light of developments since it was 10 years old. What's been really interesting, uh, you know, this is my only joke, folks, is that there are such strong, strongly contrasting views on this divestment question. It's probably the most divisive issue I've been involved in. So my joke is there's a little man on his, his classical desert island, and he's celebrating because a boat's coming, and he's finally rescued. And then there's a little man in the second panel on his little coracle, lost at sea, celebrating because he's finally reached land. And we have found that that for some people involved in this divestment discussion, it is a nonsense that we're even um, pausing to think. Climate change is a, it's a number one issue uh, facing humanity. Uh, divestment is the obvious and only moral choice, and we should get on with it immediately. Anything else is, is, is failure, weakness, dithering, and so on. Equally, we have people in the university to think, who think that this is such an affront to academic freedom and to their ability of the university to attract and work with companies to make real change without excluding them, that it's a nonsense to even put this on the table. And that has been a difficult journey to try and find my job and the job of the senior people in the university is to try and find something that works for the whole university and not just uh, individuals who feel very strongly. So this has been a real challenge. Um, what we decided to do, we consulted uh, in 2014 on the general the generality of what the PRI meant for the university, and we drew some lessons from that. And it was pretty clear that um, two issues were right at the top of people's agendas. One was fossil fuels, and the other one was armaments. And we felt, um, having initially thought that we could consult and then just agree what we were going to do on fossil fuels in the autumn of 2014, it was pretty clear that actually there was a bit more to this, and there were a lot of good arguments being put forward by the divestment campaigners, and there were equally counter arguments being put forward by people who opposed divestment, and that we should really gather some evidence and have a proper look at this. And so that's what we did, and I'll, I'll spend the bulk of the rest of my time talking through what we did and how we decided it. It's interesting, though, that even there, and you know, I am sympathetic, I try and represent the student view of this as I can, for people who've been campaigning, who felt that the signing of the PRI at the start of 2013 was a clear signal, who felt that the arrival of a director of SRS for the first time in the summer of 2013 was a clear signal, 
who felt that the um, consultation in the early part of 2014 was clear signal to arrive at the autumn of 2014 for the university to then consider having another group was frustrating for them. And I think that led to some of the tensions that we had when we announced. Having said which, I think the review group was very helpful. Um, we uh, had a pretty senior group which involved myself, our senior vice principal at the right hand of our, our principal himself, um, our director of finance, our director of planning, two senior academics, one with an understanding of fossil fuel extraction, and one Andy Kerr who runs our climate uh, innovation centre, um, and a professor of law. So we had a pretty good, oh sorry, and student representation I should say from the elected representatives. So we had a pretty good mix of academics, managers, students. It was a pretty intensive process, I have to say. Um, we met on six occasions. We took the decision to put all of our evidence and papers and so on online. Um, so if you look at that link, fossil fuel review, ed.ac.uk, you can find every scrap of paper we produced. Even that was interesting in that uh, some of the student campaigners told us at the end of all this that we're being very untransparent, which was a little frustrating because, you know, uh, you don't have to agree with the decision, but placing all of your papers online the day you launched the report seems reasonably transparent to me. One thing I was keen to do was that we would use this group to not make a decision, but to explore the territory and bring back potential options to senior managers. We had looked at how other people had done it, and we felt to some extent it set up a small group. That group had uh, gone off into a huddle and come back with a bit of a bomb sometimes that hadn't really given any room for maneuver. It was a yes, no, binary, black and white, Jedi versus uh, the Sith-style discussion. Um, so we decided that our group would be making recommendations and options. What, what was the possible landscape here? And it wasn't a Robert Frost, two roads diverge in the forest. And I think that worked from our point of view. We discovered new things we thought, new areas to explore. We also gave the group five criteria to report against. And I can comment on the criteria if people want me to. But again, the group was coming back with options against criteria to allow discussion, not a single answer. Um, so what did this group actually uh, propose? So we um, reported in the spring, having spent, as I say, about six months looking at it. Well, we, put, we, we identified six possible options, and, and there's quite a lot of complexity in here, so I'll maybe talk through them quickly, and then I can come back. At either extreme, if you like, was, was the no action or full divestment. So we quickly ruled out no additional action. We felt this issue was too serious for the university to simply shrug its shoulders and say, um, no, we're not doing anything here on investment. We did want to make the point, though, and we've been making it ever since, that regardless of what we had decided on investment, this university in particular was making a significant contribution in other ways through trying to cut carbon emissions, the research we do, the teaching and operations. Again, I can talk more about that. We discovered along the way that for every pound we might get from a, uh, a company involved in oil and gas in some way, we be spending 17 pounds on mitigation alternatives and carbon capture and storage. We also discovered the majority of the money we get from oil and gas companies is to mitigate pollution, to find alternatives, and to look for ways to capture the carbon. So um, we feel that you know, regardless of what we do on investment, we're doing lots of other things. Having said which, we rejected option one. We also rejected full divestment, which is option six. We weren't convinced, and I can explain why. The main thing that we did then was, was option five. That's the one that attracted the most attention. We decided to divest from the highest carbon emitting fuels where there were alternatives. And we got into difficulties on the comms of this because it looked like a, 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 we were trying to welch out of something. But actually, um, we were simply trying to say, from our point of view, what matters here is the amount of carbon that, that gets into the atmosphere. That's what drives the atmospheric physics. Whether it's coal, gas, or whatever, we don't care. So if down the line, having divested from coal, someone was able to get CCS working in a serious way, or if a company was investing heavily in it, we might consider getting back into coal. But as it stood, we didn't think there was enough happening in the companies we targeted. Um, so we divested from coal, we divested from tar sands. In practice, that has meant selling our stocks in 
uh, shell in PHP Billington and in Rio Tinto Zinc. Um, we also made it pretty clear as part of option five that from our point of view, there was no pathway that didn't involve fossil fuels in the short term. Things like gas or the use of fossil fuels in petrochem and so on. And until that was the case, we thought it was hypocritical to, to divest from them, but to continue to use them as part of society. So option five attracts most attention. We've been trying ever since to point to some of the other options, which I'll go through quite quickly. First one is that students made two arguments to us effectively to simplify. One was the moral one about divestment. The second one was a practical question about fin uh, financial value, the stranded assets argument. And if you've been following the carbon tracker, you'll see they've had some impact. The Bank of England governor was talking about it last night. When we started this process, the stranded asset argument was one that only really the students were making within the university. By the time we finished this process, it was clear that this was a serious argument, whether it's true or not, and how true it is over what timeline is still to be figured out. But our investment committee will now pick this up and make sure that we are not investing in, in, in uh, companies that are about to lose tremendous amounts of value. So this is a straightforward um, financial question well, actually, not that straightforward to work out, but straightforwardly financial in its terms, and we'll look at that. We've got option three on the table there, what we call identify and replace. This is the idea that you can calculate the carbon footprint of your overall endowment fund. You can calculate the carbon front foot footprint of individual products associated with, say, tracker funds. So for those who don't know, a tracker fund would be one that tracks an index like the FTSE 100 or FTSE All Share or something like that. And we were saying to ourselves here, if you've got two tracker funds and they have the same level of risk and return, why would you not invest in lower zero carbon, you know, based on the commitment and, and the recognition this is serious? And if those products don't exist, we'll add our voice to those calling for these products to exist. And so that's something we're working through right now. Our investment committee will now be seeking in future to put pressure on and to identify and uh, invest in lower carbon collective products, if you like. The final one we, we thought was reasonably innovative was option four. And this is where we were saying that it's not just the fossil fuel companies that drive carbon. It's all of us, businesses and individuals, by using these products anyway. And the products are used as part of the entire value chain, including manufacturing, transportation, uh, shipping, aviation, and so on. So here what we're proposing, well, we're not proposing, we're requiring companies, if you're not um, currently reporting carbon, why not? That's not good enough. Uh, these days we expect all of our companies to start uh, reporting carbon. And if you don't, over time we will divest from you. There's no reason, no excuses. So that's part one. Over time, we couldn't help but notice as well that if you take an airline, it's inherently high carbon at the moment, but within that, you can differentiate. There are certain airlines per passenger kilometer who emit far more carbon than others. Now, why is that? It must be because certain management teams are not taking the issue seriously. So again, we will start to try and apply pressure. We will probably work with the Carbon Disclosure Project, Project or others to over time work out the best way to put some pressure on the supply chain to get carbon down. So that was the rather complicated package of options that we put together. You could maybe see why um, the comms of that got more difficult and we perhaps got into some public difficulties. But we did feel that we thoroughly explored the landscape. And again, having talked quite a bit there, I'm just going to pause in and hand back, uh, take clarifications and questions. Right, thanks, Dave. I've got three questions that have come in while people digest what you've just said. So, Peter, uh, does the university track the impact of its ethical investments and potential losses and the impact on the endowment growth as a consequence? Okay, absolutely, yes. So, we're now at this stage of, if you like, handover between myself and the fossil fuel review group and the actual investment committee. And, up, you know, it, it so one thing is um, we would rapidly, I think, look again if we found that there were massive losses associated with what we've just decided. The reality is, though, we think that's pretty unlikely, but that would be something for the investment committee to point out. And we are quite up front about it. It's the investment committee's job to try and make the best return it can within the mandate given to it by the university. 
it will, as you might expect, argue that the fewer limitations you give it in terms of freedom, the more freedom it has to seek the best returns. University accepts that, but says, however, there are certain things beyond which you shall not pass. Tobacco is one, controversial weapons is another, and um, coal and tar sands are the third. So it is the investment committee's job to keep an eye on this, um, but at the same time, the university will accept lower uh, um, returns, and the question is how much, and that's a dynamic that you know it has to be just worked through. So it's not an absolute we'll accept any ethics at any price, and neither is it we will only accept things that um, uh, don't cause us any costs whatsoever. It's somewhere in the middle, and that's quite difficult to actually write down that as a percentage or anything. Um, I don't know if that answers the question well enough. Okay, thanks, Dale. I'm sure Peter will come back uh, if he has sub, sub uh, questions. A question from Joe. Um, how much influence, uh, in your experience, can you have over fund managers when the scale of investment isn't large enough to have your own portfolio? Sure. Um, so that's been a key and interesting one. The students' view was when we put our report saying, uh, I was insistent, I'm an ex-regulator, and I've always insisted that you talk, you don't demonize companies initially, you talk to them first and engage with them. And so the, example, the reason I always say that is imagine the first time you had any contact with the, with the um, uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs is when they prosecuted you because you'd not got your tax return right. You know, you might expect that they'd maybe talk to you first and possibly offer you some advice. That might be a good place to start. We felt that really to just immediately demonize the companies involved and write to them telling them they were out wasn't right. And so we gave a period for, to engage with those companies. Their engagement has a, a bad reputation amongst some, possibly justified in some cases, because it can go on endlessly and it doesn't achieve any change. But we were quite clear that ours was going to be short and sharp, so we were giving them four weeks um, to engage. Now, this is just where it comes down to judgment. The students would say that, um, well, we think they've said slightly conflicting things. They've said when we want to engage individually on coal and tar sands that we're far too small, Joe's point, far too small to make any difference, nobody will listen. But somehow that's magically transformed when you talk about all divestment, that this is then magically of enormous significance. And we found that a difficult, you know, we, we've questioned them on that. We think it's the opposite. We think actually that rather untargeted campaigns don't work as well, but targeted campaigns that apply pressure in particular places have a better chance of succeeding. Uh, now that's a, just a judgment call. All I can say is we, we are um, happy that when we divested from the three companies that we've now named, that they did indeed know us. And you know, I can't go into details, but, it, but suffice it to say that we had some um, meetings with the highest possible level of these companies. Drop, drop a hint there what that means. And they were very interested to understand why we were divesting, um, the basis of that divestment, um, how they could get back onto our list again, if you like. Um, and one of my colleagues, I think, is listening in. Liz Cooper did some work for us to try and explain this. So we were saying to them, um, you're telling us that you're on a pathway to transition, and we agree with you, there needs to be a pathway to transition. You're saying that you take this seriously. So why are you spending one hundredth of one percent of your profits on transition? That doesn't sound serious to us. And so we were able to give them a quite specific, sharp-edged comment about what it would take to get back in our uh, investments will sell your coal or your tar sands stocks, or make much more significant investment in the alternatives and the mitigation. And they would say to us, we're doing very well on our direct carbon. And we would say to them, well, good, good for you, and there are lessons for the whole university sector to learn about direct emissions. It's not about direct emissions, it's about products and product emissions, and you're not doing well enough, in our opinion. We think that worked much more much much better than a rather untargeted, we're selling all coal and tar sands. Now, people don't have to agree, but that was our sense of it. So a long way of saying, in a nutshell, the way we did it, we think worked as well as we could have possibly hoped. And we're not free to discuss all the details because we, we want to keep some of these discussions with companies confidential. But it's fair to say they have noticed, and they've noticed 
far more compared to the size of the stocks that we're selling. If your shell and your 450,000 million um, annual revenues, it's interesting that, sh that the university sells some million pounds worth of stocks and we, we're still engaging with them at the senior level. I'll stop there, Ian. Thanks, Thanks, Dave. That's an excellent answer. Uh, last question in this session, uh, in this round. Uh, did the uh, university consider ESG funds managed by United Nations uh, PRI, uh, Principles Responsible Investment Signatory Fund Manager, that automatically excludes the nasties? That's from Fraser. Yeah. So we didn't do that immediately. I mean, it was on our list of when we consulted in 2014. We, we sort of touched on this territory as to do you do, you do a negative screen and, or what's your investment approach overall? But to some extent, and this is where it's ironic in a way, again, if you look at some of the coverage we got when we um, uh, announced our decision, many people said you've been subject to malign influence from the fossil fuel industry or you're just doing this for the money. You know, this is what this is about, it's weakness. Whereas we were saying, well, actually, no, we haven't really focused on the money question. We focus on what we think is the right answer to deliver some change in the space called climate change policy. And now we will look at what that means in practice. So actually, we've done it the other way around, and we are actively considering now what, it, what this means in practice. And I've discovered as a non-financial person, here's a tip for people, it's actually not obvious what you mean by a coal company, believe it or not. It's not obvious what you mean by an arms company. It's not obvious what you mean by tar sands company. And the devil is in the details. So on, beneath the, the um, announcements of many peers, and I won't name because I'm not trying to blame them or anything, you'll find there's a, there's a considerable degree of latitude that isn't in the press release. Now, we try to be honest with our press release and draw attention to some of that, and it probably just muddied the waters because pe many people don't realize that um, the way you will define, for example, uh, uh, an arms company is if only 20% or more of their revenues comes from armaments. Um, so that leaves considerable latitude for a major conglomerate, which has a sideline which is massive but small compared to the company. And Shell is a good example of this. In one sense, they're not a tar sands company because less than what is that? Uh, less than one percent of their revenue comes from tar sands. In another sense, of course, they are a tar sands company. They're one of the largest in the world that deals in tar sands. Um, so this is what we're going through right now. How do you now reconcile in a way that is practical, but also meets the university's requirements. And so I, 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 touch, I touched on it at the start, we've got five criteria that we use to judge the fossil fuels issue. Criteria one was in line with the values or not. Um, criteria two was, if we took a decision, is it in line with the general approach that we think is correct in this topic? Um, criteria three was around the impact on uh, other relations, if you like, with that company. So can we still accept money from them? Can we research with them? Can we teach about these things? Can we buy from them? But the two that are relevant to the question are, one was the impact on capital and returns, and the other one was, is there a product out there that can actually deliver this? And so what you'll find, and I would caution the people who have smaller endowments, it works like this. If you've got an investment manager and say, hello, I've got £100 to invest, please invest it as you see fit, there are no restrictions. They will charge you less on the whole than if you say, hello, I have £100, I'd like to um, uh, exclude uh, fossil fuels, please, and armaments and other things. And particularly if you say, I'd like to do it in a particular way bespoke to my university, which doesn't match the industry standards, then you're going to get higher fees. And so there's a trade-off between what you think is right what is actually out there and how much it's going to cost you to implement. And that is something that we are wrestling with at the moment and working through. I'll pause there again, Ian. No, that, that's great, Dave. Um, I'll pick up on Jamie uh, and others' questions in the final, the next and final great. round of questions. So back, back to you, Dave. And I'll just finish quickly now, folks, conscious of time. So what have we learned? Um, really strong and polarized views, probably more than we thought. We kind of knew it was contentious, but really the, the, the level of passion that this involved, evoked has been um, very strong. But it's certainly worth engaging with. You can't dodge this sort of thing. If, if an organization like a university can't engage on these intellectual questions, then who can? So we, we don't regret in one sense. We don't think the issue would have gone away. 
we welcome that the students feel strongly about it. We give them the right to protest and occupy buildings. Um, and we hopefully have listened to, they don't agree with, some of them don't agree with us, but we, I think it's difficult for them to say we haven't listened hard. I think we had a quick look at the start of this process. At the time, there were 400 universities around the world that were um, subject to some, some sort of campaign. Um, 40 of them at the time, this is maybe a year ago now, had made a decision. Roughly 20 of those 40 had decided not to do anything, and roughly 20 had decided to divest in some way. So what that tells us is that, A, this isn't the straightforward choice that sometimes is presented by campaigners, because if it was, why do people come to such different views? But secondly, you must make this decision based on your own circumstances and your own institution, which will vary. So we've made a decision that works for us. Does it work for you? Well, that's up for you to decide, I think. If you just try and do a, a cookie cutter off the shelf, I, I would caution against that. Um, thirdly, and I would say this, you've heard me say it uh, slightly defensively all along the way, the headlines, if you Google just now what our decision was and the reality, not always the same. So I want to take the opportunity to say the student view would be we put out a weak report. It was really cowardly and pathetic. And um, only once they occupied the building did we change our mind and uh, should do anything. I would say, and you know, believe me or not, that um, in fact that's not the case. We probably miscommunicated what we we're planning to do, but we have basically executed now what we'd always planned to do in the first place. And we think it's strong action and it's continuing action. So the student protests, we think, slightly missed the point, not being patronizing, but that's, that's our view of the world. Um, the review group itself, it was very useful. It was particularly time intensive, and we wouldn't want to do it in a hurry again, but it, it did work for us. And we feel that it uncovered some new ways to look at the issue that you, know, you might find helpful. We also felt that other decisions had underplayed the linkages between investments and procurement, research, teaching, learning, sponsorship, and grants. Even there, there is no commonality. So it seems obvious to me, if I am invested in Mr. Patton PLC, and then I decide ethically, on ethical grounds I can no longer invest in him, it seems odd to me to then accept large research grants from him to teach extensively about what he is up to and to um, buy products from him. That is the line we took. But even there, you'll find others who say, no, we don't accept those linkages. It's perfectly possible to buy from a company and divest from it at the same time. So you need to get your ducks in a line about what the institution thinks about that key question. And then finally, we learned that in our perhaps um, hubris, we were trying to move the debate on from just being about divestment to being about targeted interventions that would make a contribution to um, climate policy. But actually, we didn't do that in a very clear way. So when you contrast what we announced in March, which was a, a long package that rambled on for a page and a half, with what we announced on armaments last week, or the week before, um, very different, much crisper and clearer the detail comes later, um, and I think that's an important lesson that we've learned along the way. So finally, um, we've done armaments. Sorry, we completed fossil fuels. We've just done armaments. I can touch on that if people want to know. We see this very much, though, as part of a longer-term journey. So job not done, we're, we're on a journey. And um, very still very interested and recommend that people do have a look around before they rush to decisions. So that's me, Ian. Back to questions. Good. Okay. So the questions are coming in um, from Jamie, who led on the the engagement you referred to at the end of the last questions uh, for the university. Were students involved at all? Students weren't involved in that. No. Um, led directly by myself, one of the senior academics responsible for research, and our director of finance. And it wasn't a deliberate um, decision to exclude students, but at the same time, I would question how much they would have added to that particular discussion. It was more to do with diaries, really, with some of the people we were engaging with. Um, diaries are pretty tight, so it was a case of getting people who understood what decision we'd made um, and who could explain that decision to the company. So this wasn't um, an opportunity to, to beat the companies up. To, it was really just to explain to them the decision we just made and for them to understand it and go away and reflect upon it. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dave. Um, one of my questions uh, for the group is how, you know, what more can the AUC do to help? And Fraser picks up uh, a question similar. What scope 
does the sector have to influence the industry standards you referred to uh, for investment managers? Are, are we likely to see an off-the-shelf investment product that realistically addresses divestment concerns? Um, so, excellent point. I think it would be helpful if more universities considered signing the PRI, which gives a structure and a reason behind some of this. So some colleagues, let's be candid, some colleagues are nervous of simply responding to student pressure. Some are very comfortable with that, some are not. And we were able to say, well, actually, we're responding just as much because we signed the PRI and made a commitment to this sort of stuff. Um, so I think having more universities joining the PRI if they're able to and submitting themselves to that discipline might be useful. I think the more people who agree some sort of common approach means that it sends important signals to the people who are producing products. And I think there is a very good chance, actually, that, and what we're actually seeing it as we go, that um, um, MSCI are increasingly putting information together about low carbon alternatives, and people like BlackRock and others are beginning to develop products in the space. So I think there's a very good chance. The more universities that come to a view and join a collective voice, and this is, you know, again, students here that might be saying that's ironic because that's what our campaign's about. But I, I think that's right in one sense. We probably disagree about tactics, but the overall point about joining collectively to, to put pressure on for change in the financial industry is one we absolutely agree with. So it would be interesting, I think, to, to try and find um, uh, commonality uh, and to continue to work together to, to um, put some pressure on. Dave, um, what about um, where you are actually making a, a positive alternative to the cash that was invest, invested yep. in high carbon? Um, you know, is there an opportunity here to bolster uh, low carbon? Sure. Well, I, I think so, actually. And this is the part that if I had achieved everything I'd hoped to achieve over the last 12 months, we'd have an answer to that question just now as well. But really, the, the, the university took a decision to separate the two questions and deal with the, the one that was very much, uh, as you know, to some extent, uh, w where priorities fall also depends on the elected sabbaticals. And to some extent, last year's sabbaticals were saying, we really want to get these divestment questions looked at. So that should be your focus. So we said, OK, but you know, we, we have limited time and attention, so we'll deal with divestment first. This year, the students are saying much more, well, we've dealt with divestment up to a point, but you know, we'd like to have this positive conversation. So that's what we're just starting just now. We probably, again, undersold ourselves in the sense that we are already invested. We have a, a startup fund, and it has invested in some low-carbon um, technologies down the years. Um, and just by the nature of what we invest in, some of what we're doing automatically is low-carbon. But we are going to – we have committed um, – with the students and the students will be involved in this to have another look because you know these things do change over time so 10 years ago you might have invested in solar and put it on your roof because it was a kind of eco bling thing to make a point these days i think much more it's, it's routine business and the costs are falling and it should be over time an attractive investment so i think long story short we're just about to start that process and that this is an area where i'd be keen to learn from others you know we'd never suggest that we have all the answers. I'm very interested in what others are doing in that space, uh, answers on a postcard, because that's going to be our next task. I think this is definitely going to be an ongoing conversation, Dave. Uh, there's a question from, from Jay uh, regarding FOI requests. So uh, yeah. I think this could be a good opportunity if Jamie Agumbar from NUS is, is yeah. willing and able, yeah. just, to, just to give us a, a quick update on, on the FOI uh, work that they're doing. Cheers, Jamie. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Hi, Jimmy. Uh, yes, yes, we can. Hi. Uh, so we um, we're doing uh, our, our student officers want to do a lot more around fossil fuel divestment. So we've done two ways of FOI to all higher education for the first one, and all higher and further education for the second one. The first one was on where universities are investing their money, and the second one was on where the fossil fuel industry or the energy industry is investing in us in terms of sitting on governance panels and the like. Um, and the, the purpose of those FOIs is to, uh, it's certainly not to do any naming and shaming, it's actually to just produce a status report that we can publish in the run-up to Paris and COP, uh, showing the opportunity to do the positive investment Dave's just been talking about. Um, and I think our campaign will be after COP, we'll come up with a sort of uh, 
a sort of Blue Peter style totalizer of say 100 million or so that we want to see invested in clean tech or um, renewable industries. And uh, that will be our part of our response to COP, regardless of whether a global deal is uh, announced or not. And then, you know, when people say, where are you going to get that sort of money from? We'll say, we'll go and look in our report over there because we found, you know, three or four hundred million of money that we think is right for redistributing or reallocating or reinvesting. Uh, we're going to do some stuff on pensions and research councils as well, but it's kind of a two year bit of work that we're just heading into, of which the FOI is kind of the research bit um, that's going to steer our work. Okay, Jimmy, thank you. Uh, while you're both there, uh, maybe we can pick up on Jay's question. Uh, I don't know if you can read in front of you. Our FOI request was denied on the grounds that disclosure of information would be prejudiced to commercial liability. What's an effective uh, appeal to counter this? Um, from our point of view, I, I don't think we, you know, my understanding of FOI law is getting a bit out of date now, but if we're just about to announce something, we will hold it back and tell you to wait. In general terms, we'll answer the questions and we'll go further and actually one of the things on my list to do is we're going to gather together all the responsible investment stuff we're doing and put it in one place on the website, which will include a six monthly update to where the investments are. And we also produce once a year an investment report, which tells you where the investments are. So not only the pie chart would we do, but we'll also give you a list of the companies we're invested in. Now, to some extent, it makes it easy if you don't agree with us. To, to find out what we're doing and criticize us, and that's what people do. But we think, well, there we are then. So from our point of view, we don't think that people should have to rely on FOIs to find out what's going on. Sometimes we don't always want to be responding. It can take a while, and if we're just about to publish, we'll tell you to wait. But generally speaking, we try and be transparent and open about what we're doing, because we don't think we, we, we feel defensive or have anything to hide. Uh, I can just add as well um, that we, obviously, we've done these 140 FOIs to HGIs um, of late, and we've had about 20 come back, and the two main reasons for not giving us any information was commercially sensitive information, um, or uh, the one that Jay says, which is prejudice to commercial interests. Um, but I don't have an answer yet, because I think we're planning on appealing it, but the problem with the appeal process is it takes you know, up to a year to get the information you want, and we want this data for a report, which will, you know, we're seeing as putting a positive spin on the divestment by putting the reinvestment bit coupled alongside it. So, whether or not we bother, um, or whether or not we go to students' unions and just ask our students' unions to say, well, there's nothing to worry about with this uh, this FOI. Come on, just give me the information. We're not sure, but um, again, I'm not an FOI expert, so I'm afraid Jay, I don't know the answer. Okay, th thanks both. Um, coming to the last few minutes, so if you do have a question, anyone, do please uh, uh, jump in with it. Um, but while you're both there, um, you know, Dave has suggested that we, many of us, look at the UN uh, PRI um, uh, and look at uh, you know, buying into that. Um, uh, Jamie's talked about the uh, COP21 work and, and he and, and EAUC and, and many of the world's university and college sustainability networks have signed an open letter to COP21. Um, both of you, do you have any thoughts on what you'd like to see coming from the EAUC next on supporting supporting our members wrestling you know, with this uh, agenda and, and uh, responding positively to it? Hmm. I think um, my my desire would have been if I picked this up in 2013, rather than spending lots of evenings, albeit with a glass of wine, reading through reports to try and get to the bottom of some issues, to have um, a sort of handy guide, you know, a dummy guide to. So I've had to learn over time the difference between uh, first loss and mezzanine finance and, and, and all these kind of things that otherwise you, you, you don't have so much credibility. So some explanations of how finance works and some top tips from people who've done it as to what are the issues to consider, you know, not to decide on, but to consider. These might be useful things to save some people time. You know, if we were to do it again now, we'd be able to do it much faster because we've done it before. Um, I think uh, this point about collective action in some sense is worth exploring. Quite what that means for you, Ian, I'm not sure. But I think even things like this, you know, I've been happy to share because, like I say, if I was doing this, I would have been hoping to tap into other people's learning. But there may be some opportunities to increase the scale of the influence 
of, of the sector through the EAC, AEUC, possibly? I don't know. Uh, that was my initial thoughts. I'd add to that as well, though. I think, um, I mean, Ian, you've got much better relationships at the AUC with people like Bustock, you know, the British University Finance Directors yeah. Group, um, yeah. probably UUK. Uh, I mean, my my kind of feeling is that this is vice chancellors kind of don't really mind which way divest or even divest invest goes. It's more of a finance director thing. Um, yeah. uh, you know, vice chancellors probably see it as a reputational risk uh, more so than a financial risk. So yep. you could probably do some, you, know, you could probably hold some sort of round table or forum yep. or, or do some political lobbying with the right groups that will help make it a bit of an easier transition because I mean, we are NUS and we're not, um, you know, we're not PMP in, in that we're not as activist -y, but you know, even a lot of universities are failing to open up and tell us what's going on through our FOIs and I know FOIs can be quite antagonistic but that isn't, that isn't our purpose at all. So. Um, I'm sure EAUC has a much um, stronger position from the centre ground. Can I, can I come in as well? Ed's Fraser in Aberdeen. Um, at the EAUC conference, there was a session, uh, Jan Gindre from the UN, um, speaking about principles for responsible investment. And unfortunately, because it clashed with something else, there wasn't a, a huge number of people there. But he was very interesting. And uh, I suspect that the, the document that Dave was describing is, is maybe... Um, fairly complicated. It might not be that the AUC itself has the capacity to do something like that, but it might be that um, through connections like Jan or others, there might be uh, there might be something that they could that they could provide. It may even be that the AUC could um, become a signature signature itself to the uh, UNPRI and uh, and actively encourage um, other institutions to do it. Because I, I I actually suspect that most of our fund managers. I'm not sure you can even be a fund manager and not be a signatory to it, but uh, <laughs> I suspect that most of them are already. But certainly Jan was keen that universities sign up, and I can't remember quite how, how many said, but it was a relatively small number globally that were signatories. Can I just jump in on that point? I think that's absolutely right. I think that um, what you might find is that, to some extent, your investment managers, if you're a relatively modest client, won't come forward offering you things unless you ask. Many of them are, um, there's asset owners and asset managers. Most of the asset managers, the big ones, are, are members of the PRI and are kind of waiting to some extent to be asked some of these questions. If they're not asked, they won't always come forward and tell you. Um, the other thing about the PRI is it's growing uh, quite rapidly and has you know, quite a bit of organizational heft. And as a member, they will talk you through a lot of this stuff. So we can have a number of conversations with them just to sort of explain the territory and you know, be pointed in the right direction and so on. So. Um, and it is free to join. There is a commitment at the end of it, which you must report then, um, but I could imagine that there might be some useful dialogue there, so absolutely. Can I just say thanks, Fraser um, and Jimmy, for, for, for you know, contributing there spontaneously. It's really, really helpful, um, and, and we definitely will be picking that up. Maybe, Jamie, we need to be looking at a subsequent webinar when the NUS is, is clearer on, on uh, you know, its strategy. Uh, because, you know, for, for me, staff and students have to work as one on this. Uh, I don't think there are any questions, and we're out of time. So I wanted to formally thank Dave. Dave um, is at the Vanguard, and uh, we're, we're in your debt, Dave. Uh, you, you know, you've, you've had a steep learning curve, uh, a few highs and a few lows and a few scars. But you've been willing to share that, and I think that's been profoundly valuable to, to members. Great. We are grateful to you uh, and to Edinburgh. Um, um, and to all of you for being part of this webinar, I'll hand back to Nina to close off. Thanks, Ian. Yep, so that, that's the end of today's webinar. Thank you again to Dave um, for sharing his insight and to Ian for sharing um, this meeting. Um, I'll send over the link to the podcast in due course. Um, and thanks again to everybody for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks, folks. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Cheers, Ian. Thank you.